The subject we're going to be discussing now is entitled The Seat of the Dragon. You'll remember that yesterday we went through some pretty difficult information. The last couple of lectures, what we did is from the start up to the fourth lecture, we built a foundation on which we could start this journey. From lecture five onwards, we've said, well, let's understand that the word tells us that Satan has fallen from heaven. He used to be Lucifer. He's now Satan. And in that, with him falling, he now deceives the whole world. In order for us to be able to watch and see, as Jesus and the various apostles said, warn us about the future to identify what we need to look for. When the disciples came to Jesus, they said to him, tell us what must we look for? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Jesus said, make sure that no man deceives you. So over the next couple of lectures, we're going to be looking into some very interesting and some very dark subjects. The Seat of the Dragon has been entitled that for a specific reason. And through the lecture, it'll make more and more sense. When I do this lecture and the next couple of lectures, I get people that come to me and they say to me, why are you honoring Satan by speaking about him? And I say to them, no. I'm not honoring Satan by speaking about him, but you cannot expose him if you don't speak about him. You see, the Bible warns that Satan will transform himself into an angel of light. That is somebody who comes speaking godly things, giving you the warm fuzzy feeling. And his ministers will come as ministers of righteousness. And if it is the case that Satan is coming across as light, and Jesus is coming across as light at the same time. You've got two contradicting lights. There's no way to identify the one from the other unless you turn Satan's light into the truth that it is, which is darkness. In other words, if we're going to be looking at a picture, maybe the picture behind me on the wall, you'll notice there that the point of the greatest impact is the point of the greatest contrast. In the same way, the only way to understand the deceptions of Satan is to contrast his darkness that is masquerading as light against the truth of Jesus Christ. This way, we'll be able to color in the picture and realize that Satan has been a liar from the beginning, exactly as it says in the Word of God. This message, again, is heavy on the heart. Truth is independent of your or my opinion. By its very definition, truth is intolerant of error, every aspect petitioning to the conscience for acknowledgement. The individual, that's you and I, however, hold the key to admit or reject this information. So from here on in, I'm going to have to speak straight. There's no way I can beat around the bush. There's no way I can soften this message. If we are going to expose Satan for who he is, we're going to have to pull the blanket off and speak straight. In the previous lecture, we looked at 21 biblical identifying marks or identifying characteristics that the Bible lays out to warn us the Antichrist figure will have the following identifying marks. Look out for him and point him out that you can see where he is, who he is, and what he's doing in the world. We're not the first to have gone through this exercise. Martin Luther, who uh, was possibly and probably the most renowned reformer of all time. He's, uh, it's written in the history of the Reformation of the 16th century in the book on page 215 that Luther proved by the revelations of Daniel and St. John, by the epistles of St. Paul, St. Peter, and St. Jude, that the reign of Antichrist predicted and described in the Bible was the papacy. Luther knew who the Antichrist was. What about Thomas Cranmer? This is the founder of what we now today know as the Anglican movement. 
Thomas Cranmer wrote, Whereof it followeth Rome to be the seat of Antichrist, and the Pope to be the very Antichrist himself. I could prove the same by many other scriptures, old writers, and strong reasons referring to the prophecies of Revelation and Daniel. Again, it's not just him and Luther and you and I that know this truth. In the book, uh, All Roads Lead to Rome, there's a whole cloud of witnesses that know the same. Wycliffe, Tyndale, Luther, Calvin, Cranmer. In the 17th century, you had Bunyan, the translators of the King James Bible, the men who published the Westminster Baptist Confessions of Faith. So Isaac Newton, even. Wesley, John Wesley, Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, more recently Spurgeon, Bishop J.C. Ryle, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. These men, among countless others, all saw the office of the papacy as the Antichrist. So even though this might have come as a shock to you when we did that biblical revelation in the previous lecture, this has been common knowledge for many, many, many years. Why doesn't the media tell us about this though? What's going on? Why don't I know this information? Well, you see, this is the reason that we're doing these lectures. It's being covered up to a certain extent that we now have to come and expose the deceptions that the Bible speaks about. These are words spoken by Our Lady of La Salette to Melanie Calvat. This is in 1846. This is a fully approved Catholic Church apparition. It, the words state the following, from a Catholic source. Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. Another Roman Catholic source, which is the last days of the Catholic Church, page 3. This is by a conservative Roman Catholic scholar, uh, W.F. Strogi. He writes, I scoff at the notion that anyone other than the Pope could be the Antichrist. We've identified that the Antichrist is the papacy, the false system of worship that he heads up. Now it is critical to understand how this Antichrist power will deceive the world on behalf of Satan. And that's why I've entitled this lecture, The Seat of the Dragon. Because in Revelation 13 verse 2, it states the following. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, and its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. Now listen to the wording. And to it, that's the Antichrist beast, the dragon gave his power and his throne and his great authority. Here we have a reference to the Antichrist beast, and we have a reference to the dragon. Now just as I did in the previous lectures, I'm going to ask you again. Who's the dragon? Well, I can't tell you who the dragon is. The Bible has to tell us who the dragon is. Let's look at Revelation 12, verses 7 to 9. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. And that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Another reference in Revelation 20, verse 2 says, And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. Here the Bible points out to us that the dragon is Satan. Now there was a war in heaven between Michael and Satan. Between the Michael means, the, the, just like the word Jacob meant the deceiver and his name was changed to Israel, the man who fought with or wrestled with God and overcame, the overcomer. The name Michael means he who is what God is. So there's a war in heaven between he who is what God is and the dragon who is Satan. The dragon loses the opportunity or the option to be part of the heavenly kingdom, falls out onto this earth, and that war which happened in heaven continues to die on this earth. The problem is, as we said yesterday, not too many people are willing to worship Satan. If you were to walk into your living room, as a cloven-footed gargoyle with a pitchfork, a tail, and blowing smoke and fire? You wouldn't bow down to him, would you? Well, if he's, the, the war in heaven was about worship, because he said, I will be like the Most High, I want that worship for myself, well, that war continues today on earth. And he's, if we're not going to bow down to him openly, well, then he's going to have to trick us into doing something that we might previously not have planned to do. 
And that's why in Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5, it reads, When the disciples came to him and asked Jesus, Tell us what will be the sign of thy coming? Jesus says, Take heed that no man deceive you. The Catholic National in July 1895 said, The Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself hidden under the veil of flesh. We have in Revelation 13 verse 2, the Antichrist power receiving his power, his throne and his great authority from the dragon. That's why this lecture is called the seat of the dragon. Because the dragon, Satan, cannot do this work on the earth by himself or on his own. He gives his power to a human being and he says, you will deceive the world on my behalf. So what we need to look for in this lecture is a link between the Antichrist beast and the dragon. If our lecture that we did yesterday was true, not only will we be able to find a link between the two, but we'll be able to find the constructs of this link between the Antichrist power and the dragon. Revelation 13, verse 3 to 4, reads as follows. And all the world wondered after the beast. How much of the world? All the world wondered after the beast. Now listen to these sad words. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. Stop there for a moment. This is a prophetic statement. All the world... Every single country around the world worshipped or wondered after the beast. So this antichrist power at a certain point in time will transfix humanity that all the world will wonder after him. Oh, And by doing that, it continues, the worship that we give the papacy or the antichrist beast is actually being channeled through to Satan. So in reverse with Satan, gives the papacy his power, his throne, and his great authority. He does so that he can receive worship. So by acknowledging the papacy and by by following what he says we must do, we are actually channeling worship through to Satan. So how is Satan going to deceive mankind into worshiping him? Well, let's go back to the core element that we discussed yesterday. You'll, You'll remember that In the lecture called Who is God? We looked into the sanctuary and we saw that every element of the sanctuary from the single entrance through to the laver of washing, through to the lamb, the high priest, every single element had a reason for being there. Where the one entrance into the sanctuary represented or pointed towards Jesus Christ as the only way to salvation. The lamb pointed towards Jesus being the the lamb offering on our behalf. The high priest pointed to Jesus Christ being the high priest in heaven. The laver of washing pointing towards baptism into Jesus Christ, etc., etc. The entire sanctuary in the Old Testament is fulfilled in Jesus Christ in the New Testament. The sanctuary is a depiction for the people in the Old Testament of the gospel that we have today. Not only does it depict the New Testament gospel, But it also points towards a heavenly sanctuary. You'll remember we looked at Hebrews 4 verse 14 that spoke about Jesus as the high priest that is passed into heavens, Jesus the Son of God. This is explained further in Hebrews 8 verses 1 and 2. The paraphrase that we put together says that we have such a high priest in heaven, a minister of the sanctuary, which is the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Here on earth, man pitched the tabernacle system or the sanctuary system. That was pitched by Moses. Here's a true tabernacle of which the one on earth was a pointing towards the true tabernacle which was pitched by God and not by man. In this sanctuary system, in the holy of holies of the sanctuary system in heaven is the throne of God. On earth it was represented by the Ark of the Covenant and above the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, the two covering cherubs and the Shekinah glory, the very presence of God. When you walked into the earthly sanctuary, you walked through the single entrance and the single entrance was on the east side. Now, every single thing in the sanctuary or in the tabernacle had a reason for being there. The reason for the one single entrance on the eastern side 
is explained in Ezekiel 8, verses 15 to 18. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. When you walk into the temple, you are automatically facing the Shekinah glory. You are facing the temple, the holy, and the most holy. And inside the most holy is the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, the Ten Commandments, the pot of manna, Aaron's rod, the covering cherubs, and the Shekinah glory. You are facing the light of God. Here, the word is telling us that they, they're asking, O oh, son of man, have you seen this, the abomination? Turn thee and look to see the greater abomination. So this is somebody that says, turn around and look to see what's going on. This continues in verse 16. He brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east. And they worshipped the sun towards the east. Here, inside the temple of God, where the prophets or the, the people, the high priest or the, the, the people bringing sacrifice, when they would walk into the temple, they would face the Shekinah glory. He's saying, but hold on a second. There's 25 people inside the inner court that have turned their backs to the Shekinah glory, the light of God, and they face the east. They have their, their faces towards the east and they're worshiping the sun towards the east. Ezekiel 8 verse 17 says this, Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? You see, this is a very serious charge. Here was a group of people within the religious system that were making like they were part of the system, but they were actually fulfilling sun worship. In the two options that we had in those days, you either pointed west towards the Shekinah glory as you walked in the eastern door, or you turned around and you faced, it, faced east. You see, on the Ark of the Covenant, the two covering cherubs represent, as the sanctuary did the, the sanctuary in heaven, the two covering cherubs over the Ark of the Covenant point towards the two covering cherubs over the throne of God in heaven. And Ezekiel 28 explains exactly that. Satan, when he was Lucifer, was one of those two covering cherubs who actually covered the light of God, protected it as, as it were. It says, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub. Lucifer was one of those cherubs who sat right next to the throne of God looking into the Shekinah glory, kneeling at the throne of God. But Satan wanted that Shekinah glory for himself. His name means the light bearer, Lucifer. If I was to calculate the brightness of a lamp or the projector in the hall today, I would calculate it in lumens, the number of light. So Lucifer means the bearer of light. And he was to carry God's light, but he didn't want to carry it, he wanted it. He wanted to emanate that light from himself. And therefore Isaiah fourteen twelve to 14 is very sad. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. And that's very important, the sides of the north. I will ascend unto the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. This is where Satan came into his true character of the satanic methods that he's going about today in the world. You see, there were only two options. Either as a, a religious Israelite, a person fulfilling God's commands, either I was going to obey and face west, the Shekinah glory, the light of God, or I was going to turn my back on God even if I'm inside the temple and faced east. Those were the only two options. You either face west and you face Yahweh, or you face east and you face sun worship. The question is, is it possible that Satan will somehow 
put sun worship inside the temple, like he did in Ezekiel, where there were 25 men inside the temple that were worshiping the sun towards the east. Is it possible that today he'll have the same plan of deception as he did in those days? Well, God doesn't change. And if God doesn't change, unfortunately Satan's plans can't change either. He might have a new element or whatever that he adds to it. But let's look if we can find sun worship involved somehow in the temple and the religious systems of the world. See, this, in this lecture we're going to be looking at this link between the Antichrist and the dragon. But we're going to split it up into two separate sections. Firstly, we're going to find a link to Satan. Can you imagine finding a link from the Antichrist to Satan? Oh, and then we're going to look at the link to sun worship. Ephesians 5.11 reads as follows. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. The King James Version reads, but rather reprove them. If you read the very next sentence or the very next verse, it says, because it is shameful to even say or speak about the things that are done in secret. Now some people say, well, there it says, don't speak about it because it's shameful to speak about these things. Well, if that was the case, the Bible would be contradicting itself. Don't have anything to do with it, but rather reprove it, expose it, get rid of it. And then say, but don't speak about it because it's shameful what happens in secret. In context, Ephesians 5, 11 and 12 explain that these things need to be uncovered in order to understand how to keep away from and make sure you don't become part of satanic deceptions. So let's look into this. Let's look into this. Is it possible we can find a link from the Antichrist to the dragon, thereby fulfilling the seat of the dragon? Carol uh, Watyelo, who became Pope John Paul II, when he was a cardinal, he said, We are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has gone through. I do not think that wide circles of the American society or wide circles of the Christian community realize this fully. We are now facing the final confrontation, listen to this, the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church of the gospel versus the anti-gospel. This is the highest cardinal who became Pope saying something's about to take place. The wider American circles don't know about this. The world doesn't know. Oh, and neither does the Christian church. But this is going to happen. One just needs to look inside the Vatican to see whether there are any possible traces and as you walk in the main entrances you look up into the ceiling of the arch and you'll see eagles crowned you'll see triple crowned tiaras and not only that on the right and on the left of the top of this arch you'll find the what's called the divining serpent the serpent dragon power that has been crowned Look a little bit further. This is the, inside the Basilica of San Pedro, St. Peter's Basilica. Gregory the 13th monument. This is the monument to him. On top of his tomb, you have the dragon with his arm over the Pontifex Maximus. This is a depiction of the power which is holding him in. Who is he working for secretly? Well, let's go a little bit further. This is an image on the papal crest itself. In the Vatican Museum, if you were to go and look for the papal crest, they would show you this is what it is. This is called the Vatican. Vatus meaning diviner, serpent being known as Khan. The Vatican or the Vatican, the divining serpent. Just the wording alone already points towards some infiltration or some hidden meaning behind Vatican, the serpent power. Walk across in the Vatican to the tomb of Pope Alexander VI and you'll find there a statue on the right of his tomb called La Verita, which means the truth. There you'll see that she stands with her foot on the earth, but she's clasping something above her shoulder or at her shoulder under her chin, as you would either a loving child or, or maybe a violin that you would play, covered up mostly by her hair. This is a statue which is called the truth, 
And if you zoom in, you see that the truth is the sun. The obelisk also has a certain representation in the Vatican. Right in the center of the Vatican, and you, as you'll see in a couple of images time, is the obelisk which has got certain pagan affiliations. Let's read what it says. The obelisk has been part of pagan worship from the days of antiquity. Obelisks have played a large part in the worship of Egypt. Originally, the obelisk was associated with sun worship. Pagans believed that the obelisk had a sexual significance. Realizing that through sexual union, life was produced, that the phallus, which is the male sex organ, was considered, along with the sun, a symbol of life. In order for the obelisk to carry out its intended symbolism, it was placed upright or erect. Thus, the obelisk pointed up towards the sun. The obelisk was often placed at the entrance of pagan temples. The obelisk is a representation of an ancient pagan rite called phallic worship. It's the combination of the male power with the female sun energy. We'll have a look at this later in some of the other evolutionary type quotations that we'll look at. But it's together with the sun's energy that certain things can take place. If you look at the center right outside the front of the Vatican is one of the largest pagan uh, obelisks that you can find in the world today. It's interesting to me to read that an obelisk was often played outside or placed outside the entrance of pagal, pagan temples. If you knew history and you understood it, that's not something I would have in front of my temple if I was a Christian. In the Old Testament, these obelisks are, of the temple are called the images of Beth Shemesh. And in Jeremiah, it's quite specific about what to do with him. It reads, He shall break also the images of Beth Shemesh, that is in the land of Egypt, and the houses of the gods of the Egyptians shall he burn with fire. Jeremiah here is pointing towards Egypt and saying, the Egyptian type religions that had Beth Shemesh type figures, these obelisks, they were known as the houses of the gods. Burn them and break them, get rid of them. They are not for Christian or religious consumption. Well, the Illustrated Dictionary of Symbols in Eastern and Western Art by James Hall explains that of the several functions of the pillar or the obelisk among early peoples, the Egyptian obelisk was worshipped as the dwelling place of the sun god. This is history confirming what Jeremiah has just told us. We'll look at that a little bit later. Let's put that on hold and look at some other symbolism. Here's an image of an Egyptian priest king being carried about in what is known as a sedia, that's this little carry box. This is about 3,000 years ago. Next to him you'll see what's called the mystic fan of Bacchus. That's that round thing with the feathers on it, which they wave next to the pharaoh or the king to keep them cool. Well, just going through these images, you see exactly the same thing being done for Pope Paul VI. He's being carried around on the shoulders with the mystic fan of Bacchus now being associated with Christianity. The Roman Catholic Pope is also carried around in the same procession and he's seated just like the Egyptian priest king and by his side the same pagan fans. What about the liturgical headdress, what they call the mitre, this, this sort of forked cleft cap that the Roman Catholic system uses? Well, this liturgical headdress is the headdress of a bishop or an abbot or the pope of the Roman Catholic Church. And it consists of a tall cap with this sort of cleft top and the two bands hanging down the back. This comes from Dagon in Mesopotamia. This is not something they've made up or something they might have considered might look good. It's a symbolism of Dagon, the fish god with the open mouth on the top of his head and the two tails running down the side of his back. Another symbol which we'll get to have to know quite well through the rest of these lectures, and this one I'm going to pull through all the lectures, is what's known as the Baal Haddad. Here's an image, the Assyrian-style relief of King Barak from, the, from Syria of the 8th century before Christ. Note the solar deity Baal Haddad shown as a disc in a crescent. This is very important, and this one I want you to keep in mind. We're going to look at this in future lectures. 
It's interesting to note that Roman Catholicism has this idea of Mary and child, Mary with Jesus. But yet all pagan religions have got the same idea. In Egypt, Mary and child or mother and child were worshipped under the names Isis and Osiris. In China, they had the same thing. In India, they have the same thing. In Catholicism, it's known as Mary and child. Going back to the Baal Haddad, this circular disk in the half moon or the crescent moon, here you have an image also from Egypt on the right hand side where you've got the all-seeing eye, which we'll get into in some depth, underneath this Baal Haddad. When the Roman Catholic Pope or one of the priests holds up the Eucharist and he turns and he looks around and he shows the congregation the Eucharist in a mass, uh, this process is called the process of transubstantiation where they t take the Eucharist, this wafer of bread, and they turn it literally into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. When he holds it up and it's revered, what they then do afterwards is they place it inside a monstrance. Here's an image of a monstrance. It, as you'll see, has got a circular disc with the rays, what seem to be the rays of the sun coming out, and underneath it you have the crescent moon. Now the depiction of it is this crescent moon device where you would put the Eucharist inside and on top, fulling, fulfilling a perfect example of the Baal Haddad from ancient times. The Baal Haddad, incidentally, was the sun god that was worshipped, with the moon representing the sea as the sun would dip down behind the horizon and die every night and be reincarnated and be born. The Baal Haddad was a fulfillment of sun worship. Today, every time a mass is done or the monstrance is used and Pope Benedict, as is shown in this depiction here, holds up the sun disk for the world to see. This is the fulfillment of an ancient pagan rite being garbed and covered under the, the cloak of Christianity. Even Mary is depicted as the woman, the bright light or the star of heaven inside this, this disc or this crescent moon. One of the things that you'll come to realize is that Satan also speaks out of both sides of the mouth. He can either be male or female. And this image shows a male saint or Jesus Christ, as it were, standing inside the crescent moon with the sun disc behind his head. Just prior to that, we showed Mary inside the crescent moon with the brightness behind her. It doesn't matter when you're working with occult forces, if it's male or female. It's all one entity. Because Jesus Christ is represented as a male. God in heaven is represented as a male. And Mark 13 verse 6 says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. With these various symbols and Things that are done in the ceremonies, people fulfill what they don't realize are actually pagan uh, rituals and rites from ancient pagan religions. The question we're asking, is it somehow possible that Satan will put, put sun worship inside his temple and deceive mankind? Well, just from what you've seen already, you can already draw a conclusion. But just take for a moment this image of the throne of the king of Rome. This is the papacy's chair, the seat of the Pope, inside St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. If that doesn't show sun worship in the temple of God, then I don't know what will. You see, the deception inside the Roman Catholic Church and inside this false system of worship has to do with sun worship. And in order to explain the depth of this deception, we're first going to have to see if we can find a link to Satan. So I'm going to ask, let's pull up the handbrake for a moment on this lecture, on the sun worship portion of the lecture, and let's see if we can find a link to Satan. I can't tell you it's there. They will have to admit that it's there. Malachi Martin is a, a pontifical professor from the Vatican. He is quoting Pope Paul VI's reference to a satanic enthronement ceremony that was held in Rome. He says... In his book, The Keys of This Blood, on page 632, the smoke of Satan has entered the sanctuary. Is it possible that somehow the smoke of Satan has entered the sanctuary? Well, let's have a look a bit further. 
Catholic Archbishop Emmanuel Malingo, this, he, he states in one of his speeches, his speech was entitled Satanists at Work in the Vatican. This was a speech that he did at Fatima 2000 International Congress on World Peace held in Rome. Read with me what it says. The devil in the Catholic Church is so protected now that he is like an animal protected by the government. Malingo obviously cited papal, statement, papal statements to back up his charges. To the question, are there men of the curia who f are followers of Satan? In other words, are there priests or bishops or some of the clergy who are followers of Satan? Malingo responded, certainly there are priests and bishops. I stop at this level of ecclesiastical hierarchy because I'm an archbishop and higher than this, I cannot go. Here is a devout Catholic priest or uh, an archbishop admitting that in the system there are certain things which the membership have got no idea about. Malachi Martin wrote a book, Windswept House, and Martin vividly described a ceremony called the enthronement of the fallen archangel Lucifer, which was purportedly held in St. Peter's Chapel in the Vatican. The enthronement was linked to the current uh, concurrent satanic rites that were being run in the U.S. In, on June 29th, 1963. Amazingly, along with what was happening in the satanic world, stuff was happening inside the Vatican and admitted to by the pontifical professor himself. In A Woman Rides the Beast, page 420 to 421, it states that one finds every shade of the New Age, occult and mystical belief inside the Roman Catholic Church. Catholic World, which is their magazine, had an entire issue affirming the New Age movement without a word of condemnation or correction. Thousands of priests and nuns practice yoga and other forms of Hindu or Buddhist mysticism. Roman Catholic retreat centers around the world mix Christianity with Hinduism, Buddhism, and all manner of New Age beliefs and practices. This image is a Catholic priest has yen for Zen. These type of ideas are not in contradiction to their be be religious or their belief systems. The Fatima Crusader, again by Malachi Martin, this pontifical professor, says that anyone who is acquainted with the state of affairs in the Vatican in the last 35 years is well aware that the Prince of Darkness has, or has had, and still has his surrogates in the, in the court of St. Peter in Rome. So there are definitely people within the system that are somehow associated with the satanic rites. Judy McLeod from Canada Free Press, she said on, on February 23rd, 2005, this is brand new, 100 Catholic priests have signed up for the world's first university course in devil worship and Satanism, now officially underway in Rome. And when I say this is brand new, people often say, oh, but the quotes you're using are from 1100 or 1200 or 1400 well, this is from 2005. A hundred Catholic priests have signed up for the world's first university course in devil worship and Satanism, now officially underway in Rome. You see, you've got to take this from all perspectives. You can't just look in the Bible and say, well, the Bible says this, a so boom, it must be that. We have to make sure that extra biblical information confirms what the Bible says. Otherwise, you become fanatical and you start Bible bashing people into believing what you believe. But that cannot be the case. You have to be able to prove from history that the Bible is accurate. What is the, according to the description of the Antichrist yesterday, what was his number? Do you remember? 666? Well, T-Systems is an international company, a, a, a huge company. As far as I can remember, they're turning, they were a year or two ago, turning over 13 or 14 billion euros, a large telecommunications company. They were invited to put a new telephone system in where if you were to phone Rome, you could phone using one telephone number. Would you like to guess what that telephone number is? Well, here's the official press release from T-Systems themselves. Call Rome 060606, one number, one city. And not only that, it says, call Rome 060606, entered into experimental stage on June 18th, 2002. 
Just stop for a moment and ask yourself, June the 18th, is there anything inside that? Well, which month is June in the year? It's a six month. And question, how many sixes does it take to make up 18? Six, six, six. Here's a 666 telephone number being launched on the six months on the 666 date. These, this is what's called signal information or secret hidden information confirming what the Bible is saying. Today, you can go onto the website, this www.2.commune.roma.it, go to their own website, Rome in Italy. There it is for all the world to see. Call Rome 060606, one number, a whole city, and everything you can do on this number. This system is now up and running. When I speak on this subject, it's such a profound topic that we have to take this from all angles. It's no more powerful than to be able to show you people that have come out of the system and with their own mouths are saying what the Bible is saying. William Schnurblin is an example of one of these people. He, he is an author of seven books. He's an ex-Satanic high priest. He is an ex-Voodoo high priest. He was a ninth degree Ordo Temple Orientis, which is the system that uh, Alistair Crowley put in place. He was a sect second degree church of satan he was a new age guru an ex-occultist an ex-channeler a ninth degree rosicrucian and an ex-high freemason he's also an ex-member of the illuminati i think this man would be able to shed some light on his experiences remember we are looking for the seat of the dragon look at these video clips together with me i was raised in a very religious home uh, but I didn't know Jesus Christ from a doorknob. I, I didn't know much about the Bible. I wanted to get into the ministry, which in my case was through the uh, Roman Catholic Church. That's what I was raised in. And I knew very little about the Bible, and I wanted to be a priest. When I got to college, however, I had my plans somewhat derailed. I'm going to pause here for a moment. Here's a gentleman. He wants to know more about the Bible and it's going into the Roman Catholic system to do so. All he wants to do is become a priest. And I wanted to be a priest. When I got to college, however, I had my plans somewhat derailed by two forces that were very strong at that time. This was the time of the Vatican Council, Second Vatican Council, when a lot of ferment was taking place in the Catholic Church. A lot of my professors were telling me that the Bible wasn't really true. What little I knew about the Bible was false that Moses didn't really part the Red Sea, that uh, Adam and Eve never really existed, that Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. What did that leave me? You know, Here I was going to be a priest, and I didn't know what to believe in. The other thing that happened, two convergent forces, is I had some professors that today would have been called New Agers. Back then the word wasn't even heard of. And they played on a doctrine that's part of Catholic theology. And this doctrine is the idea that the priest is another Christ. And when you go up on the altar and you confect the sacrament of the Eucharist, as it's called, which means you turn the bread and wine literally into the body and blood of Jesus, you are acting literally as another Christ. And they told me, these, these particular professors, if I wanted to do that, if I wanted to be another Christ, I had to do the same things that Jesus did to attain that exalted state. See, they did not believe that Jesus was God Almighty. They believed he was a kind of ascended master and that he had learned how to do all of these things by going and studying under gurus in the Far East and studying under the Magi of Egypt. And some of you may have heard about this, either from bookstores or TV shows. I've got a couple of these clips to show. But keep in mind, this is a man who wants to know more about the Bible. He goes into the Catholic system where the people with all the PhDs and THDs and DDs and all these big names behind them, big letters behind their names, are guiding him into what he now identifies as New Age theology. He's being led down the wrong path, even though he has the right intentions. Let's continue. Now here I was, I was 18, 19 years old. I was being told this stuff by people who had PhDs, THDs, DDs, you know, all that stuff behind their name, you know, Roman collars on. What was I supposed to think? So I believed in them. I began studying the occult because I thought this was a way that I would become more Christ-like. See the sinister logic. This man trying to find Jesus has now been led into the occult. I 
didn't understand that at that time. So what happened was I fell into this. And by the time I got through most of my college years, I had realized that the most efficient way, the most powerful way to acquire occult knowledge was, in fact, to become a witch. Now, that might seem a pretty broad jump from being a candidate for the ministry to becoming a witch. So from being wanting to be a priest into the New Age, into the occult, he's now being told to become a witch. Before we knew it, though, new things began to come on the horizon. Um, both some of my friends who were witches, in fact, the guy who owned the occult bookstore in town, and also some of my spirit guides, because I was also a trance medium, or what today you would call a channeler. I'd been ordained as a spiritualist minister and trained in that. Um, began to tell us that if we really wanted to understand the deep parts of witchcraft, we need to get involved in Satanism. We need to read the Satanic Bible. And so I bought a copy and looked that over, and it was very, very interesting. I found I agreed with much of it, which would have astonished me just a few years earlier when I'd begun my occult studies. And see, this is how Satan does things. He gradually introduces you to ever more and more bizarre doctrines until all of a sudden you're overwhelmed. Well, I joined the Church of Satan, and soon after that, I, uh, I ended up getting the second degree in the Church of Satan, which is called Warlock. This is the certificate, <coughs> excuse me, that you will see. This is also in a couple of my books. It's reproduced. You'll notice down at the bottom here, I even got Anton LaVey's autograph. Isn't that wonderful? For those of you that don't know who Anton LaVey is, Anton LaVey is the head of the Church of Satan. In order to get into that, though, there was something very important I had to do. I had to become a Freemason, because you can't get involved in Satanism on the hardcore level without first being a Freemason. And so I found someone, I was sponsored into the Masons, and I became a first, second, third degree Mason. Uh, I went through the York Rite, I went through the Shrine. In fact, this is my, uh, my little Shrine portrait here. As you can see, by this time, I'd kind of shed some of my hippie appearance. Uh, <laughs> I just shudder every time I see that thing. Um, but this is just kind of by way of documentation that I, I really was involved in these things. That was my official shrine portrait, which they took as part of my initiation. Uh, then soon after that, I, I went through the Scottish Rite as well. So I basically covered all the branches of masonry that there are to do. Uh, and then I went even beyond that. But uh, this is my certificate. Well, as a, as a uh, sublime prince of the royal secret, that's the title, 32nd degree mason. As you'll see at the end of this clip, you'll see the Ordo Abcao on the Freemasonry certificate. This is order out of chaos. This is the, the, um, the motto that they have. They have to create chaos in order to find order. Order that comes out of chaos. Now, the information he's just given comes as a shock to many Freemasons because they don't understand at the lower levels what they're part of. I'm going to be covering this in more depth in later lectures to make sure that what he's saying about Freemasonry can possibly be true. Well, we'll have to look into this. But understand for the moment that this man wanted to find the truth. He wanted to know Jesus better. He wanted to work from, with the Bible and become a Catholic priest. He's been led into the New Age, then into the occult, and then into Satanism, becoming a, a witch. And then from there, in order to get to the higher elements of Satanry, uh, Satanism, he had to get involved in Freemasonry. And he went through all the various levels till he went to the top, which is that image that he showed us just now of him with the Shriner hat on. I just want you to notice for a moment, what is a shrine? If you were to go to the dictionary and look for a shrine, it's a temple a type of uh, place of worship. Keep that in mind as we look at the next video clip. Uh, so once I went through all of that, I was worthy, I was ready to become involved in hardcore Satanism. What did that mean? Well, that meant I had to sell my soul to the devil. I didn't know that the devil already had it, amen? This is a little ceremony that the devil likes to do, and I had to sign my name on the contract in blood. I had to sign my name in the black book. The next thing that happened, before I could get onto the priesthood of Satanism, I had to get seven people to sell our souls to the devil. The other thing I had to do, and this might astonish some of you, is I had to become a Catholic priest. I had to go back to my original vocation. Because you cannot be a Satanic priest unless, first of all, you're a Catholic priest. And if that surprises you, 
I just suggest that you go and you read some of the medieval literature. You'll see that that is, in fact, the case. Now, that's shocking. He started out wanting to be a Catholic priest. He was guided into all these, these ideas about Jesus not truly being God. The deeper he got, the more he got towards working with Satan himself and deep satanic things. And at the point in time, as he wanted to become a satanic high priest, they said, no, 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 no. You cannot become a satanic high priest until you've become a Catholic priest. And what he then says is that according to what they explained to him, because you have to be a Catholic priest to fulfill a satanic priest role, it's actually the same thing. This means that for the people on the ground who have no idea about this, they are fulfilling satanic rituals by being a Catholic priest. And in the audience, whether the congregation don't have a clue of what's really going on in the upper echelons of, of Satanism, they are actually watching and being part of some sort of satanic ceremony. This is confirmed from the Cutting Edge website, where it's quoted that former Satanists have unanimously told me that there is absolutely no difference between a Catholic priest saying the rote script, which is the Mass, before the altar, using the candles, the prayer beads, the holy water, and other implements, and a witch saying the rote ritual before the altar using exactly the same implements and that carry exactly the same meaning. Roman Catholicism said in Latin is powerful white magic witchcraft. Let's go a bit deeper and confirm whether this can be true. This is a, a, a band called Jesus and the Gurus. These are Satanists, heavy metal band. You'll see on the, on the symbol they've got the pentagram with a point up. Also, on their badge or their shield, you've got the upside-down cross. When they sing, this is their lead singer with the straight jacket on. Underneath it, you'll see the black shirt with the goat head or the, the, the head of Lucifer. You'll see there written underneath on the left, Lucifer. And underneath the right-hand side of his jacket, it says Messiah. There you'll see the pentacle or the, the five-pointed star is pointed down. These are Satanists with a guitarist playing an upside-down cross with blood all over it and nails nailed into it. Here's the lead singer again. You'll see a close-up of his shirt. It says, Demon on top. Him with his black nail polish. If the young people are wondering if there's anything, black with, or anything wrong or strange about black nail polish, well, you just have to see who does it and then wonder if you want to be associated with that. One of the main symbols they have is this two-fingered salute, the, the horned hand, or this sort of either with a finger in or the finger out, this symbol that Satanists say when they confirm their allegiance to one another. And then in this satanic singing and this ritual that they have, all of a sudden, the lead singer puts on a Catholic regalia, holds up the cross with a Bible, and goes through this ritual with Satan, imperson a man impersonating Satan on his right-hand side, also burning the Bible, as they had done so many years before. On their badge, as I mentioned earlier, is the upside-down cross, confirming their allegiance to Satan or people that hate Jesus Christ. The Texas Cop Shop of Occult Dictionary says, the inverted cross is a blaspheme or a mockery of the Christian cross. Exposing Satanism says the same thing. The upside-down cross symbolizes mockery and the rejection of Jesus. Necklaces are worn by many Satanists. It can be seen on rock singers and album covers. Take a moment and look at this image and ask yourself, what is the Pope doing sitting on a chair that has the upside-down cross embedded in the back of it? This is, these are photographs from CNN themselves. When the Pope visited the Sermon on the Mount, this is the moment that the papacy went to possibly one of the holiest places of Jesus Christ's time on earth, where he sat on his throne with an upside-down cross embedded in the back. And these children looking at the TV with the nun in absolute reverence, not knowing what to look for, not knowing what to see. This is the papal visit to the Holy Land, where the papacy sat with this upside-down cross in front of a, a symbol of Jesus Christ. Notice, interestingly enough, that he's got two fingers up, and we'll get to that in a later lecture. And the CBS caption says, The Pope sits on the altar at Chorazim. The backdrop depicts Christ with an open book that reads, Love your enemies. I will come soon. 
this person with the two fingers will come soon. We know that as being Satan, and I'll show you that in a later lecture. The inverted cross, according to Trosh, has been a satanic symbol since the 7th century. The various inverted crosses shown are signs of belonging to satanic worship. At satanic meetings, they are used in various ways to desecrate and mock Jesus. What about the bent or the twisted cross that the papacy carries? Here's Pope John Paul II with it. Here's Pope Benedict II with it. What is this all about? Well, let's go back into Catholicism and ask the uh, Catholic scholar, Pierce Crompton, Please, Mr. S Mr. Crompton, can you as a Catholic tell us what this means? He says that the bent crucifix is a sinister symbol used by Satanists in the 6th century that has been revived at the time of Vatican II. This was a bent or broken cross on which was displayed a repulsive and distorted figure of Christ which the black magicians and sorcerers of the Middle Ages had made use of to represent the biblical term, Mark of the Beast. He continues, yet not only Paul the, Paul the VI but his successors, the two John Pauls, and obviously now the Pope Benedict, carried that object and held it up to be revered by crowds who had not the slightest idea that it stood for Antichrist. This bent cross, which he holds up, and the people, oh, yay! They don't have a clue that it actually means Antichrist. Malachi Martin said that, or he, he expounded a little bit on this issue that we have currently in the media of pedophilia he said the incidence of satanic pedophilia in other words the rites and the practices was already documented among certain bishops and priests as widely dispersed as turin in italy and south carolina in the united states the cultic acts of satanic pedophilia now listen carefully are considered by professionals to be the culmination of the fallen rites did you notice that fallen was with a capital F? The satanic pedophilia happening within the church organization is actually part of the ritual of the fallen archangel Lucifer. And that's why CNN on Sunday the 15th of July 2007, this is brand new. They decided, the diocese decided to settle the sex abuse claims to a value of $660 million. This is something that's going on inside the Vatican, inside the entire Roman Catholic system. And it's something that is not being stopped. It's something that continues when they use pedophilia and they abuse children for their satanic rituals, which nobody knows about. It's not stopped. The people aren't, aren't put on, on uh, suspension You'll see in the next quote that this payment out has already cost up to two billion U.S. dollars. Los Angeles, the Diocese of Los Angeles alone accounting for a quarter of that, 500 million dollars for one diocese alone. Interestingly enough, though, from CNN themselves, they say that uh, as part of the settlement process, the Los Angeles Archdiocese released documents that showed a pattern of denial. Priests accused of sexual misconduct took sick leave. They were sent to therapy. Now listen, they were transferred to other parishes and most were allowed to continue in the ministry for years after the first accusations. You see, for the people inside, it's not a shocker. Oh, bummer, we've been caught. You know, what can we do? Malachi Martin again says, suddenly it became unarguable that now during this papacy, the Roman Catholic organization carried a permanent presence of clerics who worshipped Satan and liked it. Of bishops and priests who sodomized boys and each other, of nuns who performed the black rites of Wicca and who lived in lesbian relationships every day, including Sundays and holy days, acts of heresy and blasphemy and outrage and indifference were committed and permitted at the holy altars by men who had been called to be priests. He says in his book, Windswept House, sacrilegious actions and rites were not only performed on Christ's altars, but had the support or at least the unspoken permission of certain cardinals, archbishops and bishops. In other words, the, the top people know about this. Cardinals, archbishops and bishops. In total number, they were a minority, anything from 1% to 10% of the church per personnel. But of that minority, many occu occupied astoundingly high positions of rank. Now, it doesn't matter the percentage of rot in a system. 
What matters is the Bible says that the, there's a link between Satan and the Antichrist. What matters is that the dragon gives the Antichrist his seat, his power, and his great authority. And I get excited and I get fire in my belly when I start to talk about these subjects. And history proves what the Bible says. And all the years I was questioning whether the Bible was accurate. We found the link to Satan. Do you remember that we were busy with the, the link to sun worship? Well, I invite you to come back for section two. And we've, we're going to look at whether we can prove the link to sun worship inside the temple of God.